Let's begin by reviewing from lesson 2.7, uh, the equations of motion. Remember, uh, the equations of motion are only valid for constant acceleration. And uh, we came up with four equations. Each equation has four variables. There are five total variables. V final stands for the final velocity, the initial, acceleration, time, and displacement. Here we're going to introduce the projectile motion rules. This is a poster that's in the classroom, so you'll be able to look at it whenever you want. And uh, we already talked about rule number one in the last lesson, that the x and y directions are independent of one another. Uh, our rule number two, the acceleration in the vertical direction, the y direction, is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. In other words, the velocity in the y direction is changing at this rate. Rule number three says the acceleration in the x direction is zero. Since we're neglecting air resistance and gravity only works in the vertical direction, that means there is no force in the horizontal direction to change the velocity in the x direction. So the velocity in the x direction is constant. Another way of saying that is the acceleration is zero. Rule number four says projectile motion is symmetrical. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And rule number five, the equations of motion are applied to the x direction or the y direction. Do not mix variables in the x direction and variables in the y direction into the same equation. Let's look at the horizontal direction, uh, motion in the x direction. We'll start off with one of our equations of motion and applying uh, rule number five, uh, equations of motion are applied to the x or the y direction. I'm going to apply it to the x direction. So you see on all the variables, I put a little subscript x. Now, you, after a while, you get good at this. You won't have to do this yourself. But here I'm putting it to emphasize that we have to only use variables in the x direction in this equation. Okay, uh, acceleration in the x direction, that's rule number three, is equal to zero, so this term drops out, and we see that the final velocity in the x direction is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction. In other words, it doesn't change. It is constant. Let's look at another equation of motion. We'll apply it to the x direction, so I've put subscript x subscripts on my variables. T, of course, is not, is the only variable that is not specific to the x or y direction. So I don't need a subscript on time. Time is the same for both the x and the y direction. That's the only one of the, of the variables that is the same. Okay, so I, once again, the acceleration in the x direction is zero. So this term drops away and I get my final equation that says displacement in the x direction is simply the velocity in the x direction times the time. For something that's moving at constant velocity, you just multiply the velocity times the time, and it gives you the displacement. Here is the form of the equation that you'll see in your textbook. It is the same as this one. Now let's look at the vertical direction or the y direction. Uh, I'll start off with this equation of motion, apply it to the y direction, and now the acceleration in the y is not zero, so this term does not drop out, and this is the final uh, final form of the equation for displacement in the y. And here's the form you'll see in the textbook that is the same, uh, has the same meaning as this one. Uh, similarly, for this equation of motion, none of the terms drop out, but I'm putting the y's here in the equation to emphasize, once again, it's very important, you have to only use the y variables in one equation or only the x variables. So here I'm applying only the y variables to come up with another equation of motion for the y direction. And here is the equivalent equation that you see in the textbook. That means the same as this. And again, the other uh, equation of motion, I'm going to apply it solely with y variables. And here is its equivalent uh, equation that you'll see in the textbook. So the, the ones in my handwriting are what you'll see on the poster in the classroom, and these typed ones here are the ones you see in the textbook.
some tips about using the Y direction in projectile motion problems. There are some things you can try to remember that make uh, solving problems regarding projectile motion uh, easier. The first one is you'll notice at the top of the trajectory, that's when the velocity in the Y direction stops from going in the upward direction and changes to going in the downward direction. So for a very brief moment, the velocity in the Y direction at the highest point of the trajectory, called the apex, at the highest point, the velocity in the Y direction is zero. And this can be very helpful uh, in problems because if you choose this highest point as your initial starting point or your final ending point, then you know that the velocity in the Y direction is zero. You, you know that all the equations of motion have four variables in them. So in order to solve an equation, uh, you have to know three of the variables. So if you use this point as a starting or ending point, now you have a value, a known value, for the velocity in the y direction, whether it be the initial or the final. It's up to you. Another uh, helpful uh, tip is that the time that the projectile in, is in the air is determined solely, only, by the y component of the velocity. It does not matter what this x component is. Whatever this y component is, it's going to slow at the rate of 9.8 meters per second every second. So however long it takes for that speed to run out, and then by symmetry, which is rule number four, it'll take the same amount of time that it takes to go from the ground to the highest point to go from the highest point back to the ground. So that time in the air will be determined only by this value of V initial in the Y direction. Which leads us to another idea that if the time in the air is determined by the initial velocity in the Y direction, if the time in the air is the same, that means the initial velocity in the Y direction is the same, which also means the projectile will go to the same height. So here I've drawn three examples of different trajectories but all three have the same initial velocity in the y direction. Yes, the initial the initial velocity is greatest here, less here, and the least here, but the y component is the same. And you see for all three, they go to the same height and they will be in the air for the same amount of time. This first one is going straight up and down. The next one goes to the same height, is in the air the same amount of time, but goes some distance in the x direction. And my third projectile, uh, again, has the same y component, so it goes the same height. It's in the air the same amount of time as these other two projectiles, but because of its larger x component of velocity, it goes further in, uh, in the horizontal direction. Let's watch Professor Walter Lewin of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology tie all these ideas together in a fun demonstration. So here's the golf ball. I'm going to fire the gun now. Close. Close. Reasonably close. Well, since it's only reasonably close, perhaps... <laughs> Perhaps it would help if we give it a little bit of leeway. There goes the gun. Here comes the ball. And this is just in case. Tape it down. So as I'm going to push this now, give it a push. The gun will be triggered when the middle of the car is here. You've seen how high that ball goes, so that ball will go <laughs> And depending upon how hard I push it, they may meet here or they may meet there. You ready for this? You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Physics works. Let's watch it again in slow motion. 
This time, notice that the ball is always directly over the cart, showing that they both have the same velocity in the x direction. In this video, we'll see that the velocity in the x direction is unaffected by the velocity in the y. Obviously, the jumper has velocity in the y, the skateboard does not but they both continue to travel at the same velocity in the X. Here's some historical World War II footage. Notice that as the bombs fall from the plane, they accelerate in the Y direction, but maintain their velocity in the X direction and remain directly underneath the plane. So far, our equations of motion have been parametric equations, meaning that x is a function of time and y is a function of time. What if we want an equation that has x and y together in the same equation? What we'll do is we'll take our equation for position in the x as a function of time and we'll combine it with our equation that tells us position in the y direction as a function of time and we'll do that by solving the x equation for t and taking uh, that expression uh, and plugging it into the, y, into the y equation everywhere we see a t. So here is the derivation. You can pause the video and follow along the math if you like. But what we come up with is an equation y as a function of x. The other variables or the other co uh, terms in the equation are constants. For each specific situation, I will have some launch angle and some initial velocity. So those are constants for each specific situation, and my only variables are x and y. You'll notice that the form of this equation is y equals ax plus bx squared, where tan theta is a, and this g over 2 v naught cosine theta naught squared uh, is the b term. That is in the form of a parabola. So therefore, we know parabolas are symmetrical, so therefore we come up with our fourth uh, projectile motion rule that says projectile motion is symmetrical. So what we do is we take uh, our parabola and we divide it down the middle uh, through the apex, which is the highest point of the parabola. And uh, what this, this symmetry uh, is nice because it tells us a couple things. Uh, first, first off, if we take any point on the parabola, we can find its corresponding point on the other side of the parabola that is equidistant in time from the center point, and the velocities will be the same. The magnitudes of the velocity will be the same. Also, uh, we can see that the time it takes from the ground to the highest point will be the same amount of time that it takes to go from the highest point back to the ground. Also, the launch velocity will be equal to the landing velocity. The magnitudes of the velocities will be the same. We can then use that equation of the path to come up with a specific example of when is the position in the y back to where it started. In other words, it flies through the air and it comes back to the same height that it was launched from. In that case, the y value in the, our equation of motion for y position will be zero, and how far has it traveled in the x direction when that happens? We call that the horizontal range, the distance in the x direction that the projectile travels when it comes back to the same height that it was launched from. So we're gonna do the same thing, we're gonna have our equation in the x, but now we're gonna call our x position specifically r for range, and uh, we're gonna do the same thing we did before, we're gonna solve that equation for t, and we're going to take our equation in the y direction, plug in that expression for t, and we're going to uh, algebraically simplify it. You can pause the video and follow the math if you like. And we come up with this equation here. Uh, the product of these two terms is equal to zero. So this has two solutions, of course. R can be zero. That's not the uh, solution we're interested in. The range is zero, or excuse me, the y value is zero, the height is zero at the very beginning. Sure, that's when it's first starting off. We don't care about that. This is the term we care about. When this term is zero, that's when it's landing on the ground again. And we're going to solve that equation for r. And using the trig identity 2 sine theta cosine theta equals sine 2 theta, we 
simplify this to this, and we get an expression for our range. And this sine term, uh, we know that the sine uh, of anything varies between 0 and 1, so the range will be maximum when this term right here, sine 2 theta, is equal to 1. And so if sine 2 theta is equal to 1, we know that the sine of 90 is 1, so 2 theta is equal to 90, so that means my initial launch angle is half of 90, or 45 degrees, to give me the maximum range. When I launch my projectile at 45 degrees, I will get the maximum range. That's when the uh, ball is landing at the same level that it was fired from. And uh, if we look at this uh, graph of horizontal and vertical distances of a projectile, here's our 45 degree projectile. We see that it does go the farthest of the ones shown here. But something else interesting you notice, uh, 30 and 60 uh, launch angles land in the same place. 15 and 75 land in the same place. It turns out that complementary launch angles have the same range. Not the same time in the air now, but the same range. They'll land in the same place. So here's two examples. Two, uh, a projectile launched at 15 and 75. That's shown on the graph. Uh, if you plug into the equation, you'll see that this term, you, the sine of 30 and the sine of 150, you can try it in your calculator, is the same number. But here's another example not shown on the graph. Uh, if I launch a projectile at 36 degrees, it will land on the ground in the same place that a projectile launched at 54 degrees does. Uh, 36 and 54 add up to 90. They are complementary, and uh, they will have the same range. Remember now, not the same time in the air. The lower ones, of course, the lower launch projectiles will be in the air for less time, but they, the complementary angles still have the same range.